everyone. This is the Wednesday morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee, and we have joining us the House Human Services Committee, and we'd like to welcome you all uh, to hear uh, the testimony from the central office regarding the uh, governor's proposed budget. I just want to make sure that all uh, House members realize um, that the proposed budget uh, from the administration yesterday is for the full year and it's based off the January uh, proposal that was put in front of us. And so um, if you go to the JFO website, there's several documents and it will show the numbers uh, for the proposed budget in January and uh, it will show you the money changes and then you will also see what they're calling their restatement, they're restating their January budget. So there's some additions, there's some changes, there's some deletions, uh, but it's not a three quarter budget or just another quarter budget. It is a full year budget that will make some changes to what uh, was already passed in the quarter year budget and then complete the rest of the year. So it's a, a, it's, um, a, a full budget and I wanted everyone to uh, realize that. So we are uh, going to hear from the central office today and we have Secretary Smith. And do we have Sarah Clark? Sarah, I don't see you on yet. Oh, there you are here. It's like Holly, I, I call it my <laughs> screen. You know, I'm looking around and people move. So welcome both of you. Yeah. Um, we, um, we have you scheduled until 10 o'clock. So for an hour, if we need the full hour and uh, human services is here and for committee members, where there's natural breaking points, that's a good place to ask questions. And um, please, um, both committees, feel free to uh, have your questions heard. So Secretary Smith, I'm going to turn this over to you now. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is, this is like Hollywood Square. Sarah Clark is like the Paul Lynn in my, uh, in my seat here. So um, first of all, for the record, I'm Mike Smith, uh, Secretary of uh, Human Services. I want to thank you all for this opportunity to present an overview of our FY21 budget for the Agency of Human Services. Uh, I understand that you will, as a matter of fact, I know because I saw the schedule, that you will have individual departments in for testimony in the next few days. So uh, those detailed questions can be answered. And of course, Sarah Clark, the agency's CFO, or the Paul Lynn, as, I, as I'm starting to call her now, will be at those presentations as she is here today to give more details to the budget during the presentation and others. First off, I, I need to do this because it's been such an abnormal year um, with attention from me in particular diverted in all sorts of directions. I do wish to give kudos to Sarah Clark and her team, as well as the financial teams of all the departments in the, this agency. They put responsible budget proposals forward in record time. I don't think you'll find a place in this budget uh, that we did not take our obligation to those we serve seriously. Um, that is because of the work of the financial teams uh, here at the agency. I can't give enough praise to them uh, for what they pulled off in a very, very short time. Secondly, we are presenting a budget um, to you on the best information we have this time. Um, <laughs> uh, circumstances can change, but given what we know about state and federal revenues at this precise point in time is what we have based our budget on. Third, um, as, as the chair uh, has alluded to, um, we've based our budget off the governor's FY recommended budget. All ups and downs in this budget presentation use the January governor's FY21 recommend as the base document or the starting point. So the agency's proposed general fund FY21 budget has approximately 24.5 million in ups off the governor's recommend, 10 million in downs, and the use of $4 million in increased FMAP funding calculated until the end of this calendar year, December, to reduce our overall agency general fund 
by 31 million off the previous government uh, governor's recommend in January. Um, Sarah will go over the details in, in a moment, but I wanna point out that we felt it was appropriate to use perhaps one-time monies like FMAP, um, the FMAP bump, because it's really still up in the air what future federal revenues will look like at the end of this calendar year. Will states get more? Will there be more flexibility? These are all questions that need to be answered, but to go through an exercise where we didn't use these funds and in some case one-time funds causing perhaps needless disruption did not seem prudent at this uh, point in time when there is so much uncertainty. So we did use one-time monies prudently uh, in, in this budget. In addition, for those returning, um, despite what happens in Washington, I'll just give you a preview for January, I still expect FY22 to be a challenging budget year. Um, and lastly, there is an expenditure of approximately $6 million in here to go to Springfield Hospital. I wanted to spend a few moments and talk about that for, for just a second or two. Um, I had to make a judgment call to try and save uh, Springfield Hospital in this budget. And I have done so knowing full well it is a risk. Um, but after the hospital tried and after extensive negotiations with other potential par partners, those efforts weren't successful. Uh, instead, uh, this effort will hopefully allow them to emerge from bankruptcy with a leaner operation and assuming the court, and it is up to the court, agrees to this to try to succeed on their own again. Obviously, there were glimmers of hopes for success before the pandemic hit, uh, but as and pandemic had uh, devastating impacts on Springfield Hospital as it did on other uh, hospitals out there. But as hospital revenues return, it is hopeful that um, success will return to Springfield Hospital as well. As we saw during the height of the pandemic and any possible future surge, hospital bed space is needed in our planning when laying out worst case scenarios. Obviously here in Vermont, we've been really, really fortunate. Um, we exceeded our best case uh, scenarios. We have the lowest case count in, uh, in the country in terms of positive cases of COVID and we have the lowest positivity rate in the country. Um, but when you plan for various scenarios, whether it's a surge or other scenarios, you plan for worst case scenario. And that's what we're doing here. So um, healthcare assets uh, become uh, important as we plan this. And that's why I thought it was important, um, not only for the community in that region, but also um, for the state um, to include a expenditure for uh, Springfield Hospital. With that, I'll turn over um, the discussion to uh, Sarah Clark, who can go through the line by line items and uh, and go from there. So Sarah, or thank Paul. you, Secretary. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Sarah, do you have a presentation that Teresa can put up on? Okay, and she has that. Yep. And I did before you started, Sarah, when I did the introductions, um, Representative Pugh, you are here with your committee. Did you have anything that you wanted to say or make sure was covered? Or do you just want to chime in when, when something comes up? I should have offered that to you and I apologize. Representative Told, that's fine. Um, I think you set the stage very well uh, when you started. Um, we thank you. Um, I think it'll make our work quicker and easier to um, join you. And uh, it makes sense to save questions until, unless they're a question of content, because we don't understand words or something, um, to wait until the presentations are over. So thank you, Representative Toll. Perfect, thank you, Ann. 
Sarah, welcome. It's always good to see you. Great. Good morning and um, welcome back. Um, Teresa is going to share a PowerPoint presentation. Um, just to orient you to the materials that we've provided, we sent over this PowerPoint as well as what we would refer to as our traditional ups and downs. As Secretary Smith indicated, the ups and downs um, is based off of the GovRec, and then we show all of the changes from the GovRec to this 12-month restatement budget. In addition, I've provided our kind of one-page summary sheet that identifies for the committees the general fund changes from the GovRec. Um, so Teresa, if you want to go to the second slide. So as Secretary indicated, this budget reflects a decrease of $31 million of general fund, which is a roughly 3.1% decrease over the FY21 gov governor recommend. How it's, an, it's important to understand that this budget uh, leverages $44.8 million um, from the 6.2% FMAP bump, which essentially uh, represents general fund savings. And so that is, uh, as the secretary indicated, really one of the big ways in which um, we've presented to you a balanced budget today. Those I have a clarification uh, for you, Sarah. Just a clarification question. We've always heard that the additional FMAP is about 19 million per quarter. So how do we get to the 44.8 out of the FMAP if it's uh, the 19? Sure, and it's an important distinction to make that this 44.8 million reflects um, FMAP bump across multiple appropriations. The big one is in the secretary's office where it's about 40 million. So I think that kind of fits nicely with the quarterly estimate that you just referenced. In addition, we, are, we leverage the FMAP bump in uh, DIVA through CHIP, DISH, and CLAWBACK as well as within the 4E program in DCF. And so that's how we get to this $44.8 million. And again, Thank it's you. an estimate um, based on current caseloads. Thank you. I think it is important to understand as it relates to the FMAP bump um, that we do now know that we will be able to leverage uh, the FMAP bump through December 31st of 2020 unless legislation at the federal level changes. The reason that we know that is because the FMAP bump is in place um, in any quarter where the federal emergency is declared. Um, and because the Secretary of HHS, Secretary Azar has extended that emergency period, I believe it's through October 22nd, we know that we will be able to leverage that FMAP, FMAP bump through the end of this calendar year unless something changes from a legislation perspective. So, Teresa, can you go to the next slide? So this is just at a high level, the agency's um, uh, FY21 general fund budget. So the GovRec had us at about a billion dollars. Um, and then adding to that 12.6 million of force forecasted caseload pressures that we've experienced um, since the submission of the GovRec budget. In addition, there's another $12 million of other operating pressures. This is referring to the $24 million that the secretary referenced in his opening comments. In addition, um, these pressures are offset by the 44.8 million resulting from the FMAP bump. And then there is almost $11 million of departmental savings proposals that'll bring us to a new general fund uh, recommended level of $978 million. Next slide, please. And th these are just, I have a couple of contextual slides that I think the committees are used to seeing where we just look at, um, you know, the, the general fund budget by department uh, across the agency. I think the big takeaway that we've talked about in the past is you'll see on the general fund, um, pie chart, the Secretary's Office Global Commitment Appropriation makes up 53% of that $978 million appropriation. When you slide over on the, on the chart to the all funds across the agency, you'll notice that the Secretary's Office gets much smaller, um, but you'll see the DIVA and the Dale pie, pie pieces get a lot bigger, and that's because that's where the Medicaid program is. 
And so uh, we're looking at $2.6 billion, all funds um, across the agency in this FY21 restatement. Next slide, please. This is just a line chart of our general fund budget over time. Um, and you can see um, the $978 million that is the request in the restatement addendum budget. And then here it is again, just looking at all funds across the agency um, and our request of roughly 2.6 billion. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about some highlights um, that are included in this budget. It addresses caseload pressures that we've experienced since submitting the governor recommend budget. These include Medicaid, reach up and choices for care, home and community-based services. We'll talk a little bit more about those as we go through the presentation. In addition, as a starting point for the addendum to the FY21 budget, the agency looked at proposals that had originally been included in the governor recommend back in January, but were no longer feasible um, due to COVID-19. And so this restated budget either delays or unwinds um, some proposals um, that were no longer feasible. A few examples of that is the emergency housing restructure proposal. This budget proposes to delay any activity on that restructuring until FY22. As you are aware, um, in light of the pandemic, congregate housing was a challenge um, because of the spread of COVID-19. And so the agency is proposing to delay that in FY22 because it's not feasible right now. In addition, some of the corrections proposals, and we'll talk more about it, were not feasible. You know, kind of notably, the original governor recommend proposed to fill the Caledonia County Work Camp. Um, as you know, the Caledonia County Work Camp was uh, our site um, for kind of COVID positive individuals in light of the pandemic. And so this budget kind of restores um, the savings associated with that proposal from the original governor recommend. Um, as we've talked about, we're leveraging federal, federal funds, most notably from the 6.2% FMAP bump. In addition, there are a few places in this budget where we are leveraging coronavirus relief funds um, for areas such as reach up caseload. If you recall, um, the Joint Fiscal Committee approved, I think it was roughly $1.2 million um, at one of the meetings earlier in the spring to provide funds for reach up caseload, which has increased as a result of the pandemic. This budget proposes to leverage coronavirus relief fund dollars to cover reach up caseload increases from July to December. In addition, we are leveraging CRF funds um, for DOC staff time that is substantially dedicated to the pandemic response. And we're leveraging CRF for DMH staff and operating. All of these are expenditures that were contemplated and approved by earlier joint fiscal committee meetings. So now as I typically do, I will run you through some of the more specific proposals both in the secretary's office and I can give you a high level across each of the departments. As the secretary indicated, uh, the departments will be in for testimony starting um, I think tomorrow with this committee. So in the secretary's office, we have roughly $6.2 million in upward pressures, meaning general fund need in this budget. As the secretary um, has already highlighted to you, the Springfield Hospital Bankruptcy Settlement is estimated here to be $6 million. And that's included, that's the biggest chunk in the secretary's office. And so that needs to be general fund and CRF fund is not applicable here. So um, for right now, we are assuming that this needs to be state dollars, though you, you raise an interesting point representative toll. Um, and so there is the possibility that Springfield will be able to leverage coronavirus relief fund dollars through our healthcare provider stabilization program that we stood up in partnership with the legislature over the summer. However, it's not known yet how much they will actually qualify for as part of that process. And so because of the criticality of that hospital, 
um, we included it here um, with state dollars. Thank you. In addition, there are funds in this budget to um, provide for a general counsel for the Agency of Human Services. And um, the 211 contract, as you were aware, we're actually funding that from July to December using coronavirus relief fund dollars because of the need to continue the 24 seven coverage as a result of the pandemic. We are also planning to continue that 24 seven coverage beyond December. And that's what this request is for. On the downside within the secretary's office, this essentially frees up general fund dollars. The bulk of that is the 6.2% FMAP bump. In addition, and you'll see this across all of state government, there are internal service fund savings that um, you know, each of the internal service fund departments were able to identify and pass down to the department. So you will see that in the secretary's office budget. We are also proposing to eliminate two positions. One of the positions is vacant as of the end of August, or it will be, and the other is a filled position, but it is for a function that um, can, can be absorbed in other areas, and, um, is, and that's why we're putting it forward for elimination. There are also some savings from the Corporation for National and Community Service in the match. This is essentially the AmeriCorps program. Um, CNCS has waived the match requirements for all AmeriCorps cost reimbursement grants that were awarded in FY19 and FY20. The reason they're doing this is concern over the availability of match at the local level in wanting those programs to continue. And so they have waived the match for now and we are leveraging those savings to um, put forth this balanced budget. And that in a nutshell is the changes that you will see in the secretary's office. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Open it up to, um, to committee questions. Teresa, if we could go back to a full screen or a shared, or maybe a shared screen if we need to um, access the PowerPoint. Let's go back to a full screen so I can see questions. Okay, uh, Representative Iacoboni. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate uh, all the hard work uh, you and everybody's been been doing. I don't want to create more work. Um, so push back if, if this is not, uh, there's no value added here. But I'm trying to ascertain the potential um, one time cost pressures on FY22 by um, using CRF um, um, dollars uh, and assuming caseload and Medicaid and reach up, et cetera, doesn't, uh, doesn't abate. And um, assuming uh, the uh, um, federal match on the volunteer program, you just mentioned if some of those things were to change. Um, could you help us with that? Just so that we, am I correct that in, to a degree, there's some, uh, and I think it's acceptable, this is not a criticism, um, there's some risk uh, by shifting dollars here and there if things don't change in FY22, or am I misreading that? No, I, I think you, you raise a good point that there are significant use of one-time dollars in this budget. I'd say the primary use of the one-time funds is the 44 million in the FMAP bump. That's the biggest, biggest source of the one-time dollars. Um, but as the secretary indicated in his comments, that FMAP bump is to support states in administering its Medicaid program, which is why the agency felt strongly um, in our need to use those dollars to um, basically manage through the FY21 budget. As it relates to our use of coronavirus relief fund dollars, my hope is that some of those costs that we're using to cover cor with coronavirus relief funds will not be an ongoing pressure in FY22. Now that's still a hope. Um, so for example, reach up caseload to the extent that the, the pandemic subsides. Um, and I think that's probably still a big if, right? Um, and the economy starts to more re to recover on a more permanent basis the hope would be that reach up caseloads would decline. And so that we wouldn't see that same continued cost pressure in FY22. 
But as you also rightly pointed out, there is a smattering of other kind of one-time sources like the CNCS match that's waived on a one-time basis. And so it's something that we, as we prepare to build 22, which believe it or not will likely happen at the end of this month, we'll start that work. Um, we are acutely aware of the agency um, of our need to um, essentially replace these one-time funds when we build FY22. Did I answer your question, Representative Yacovoni? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Representative Pugh. Um, thank um, I have, if, if possible, I have two questions. One might be more for um, Secretary Smith, um, having to do with the elimination of the two positions um, in central um, office. And uh, Sarah re reflected one is reflected them generally. And uh, from the policy perspective, I'm curious as to what those actual positions were and what were the functions. Sure. Um, am I, can you hear me okay? I just want to make sure because I'm, yes. I'm getting bounced off and on <laughs> this. So um, one was uh, classified as a, a general counsel and some many of those responsibilities, and that person's retiring, by the way, and many of those responsibilities are being picked up by the general counsel out of the secretary's office. The other one I dealt with uh, data, if I remember Sarah correctly, and if you could help me out with with that, I would uh, I would appreciate it. So, um, sure. um, the other position is an administrative position. Both of them were involved with how we um, used to kind of manage and operate our large scale IT projects. Um, since they were created in the secretary's office, as you are likely aware, the kind of management and responsibility for those large scale IT projects has been pushed back more to the departments, uh, most notably the Department of Vermont Health Access, DIVA. And so that, that's why at this time um, we are proposing to eliminate those. So, the, so one of the, um, Secretary Smith, one of the, um, the general counsel, one of the positions you're talking about is a general counsel that was for within a department because I saw on the up is having a general counsel. So I'm just confused. Yeah, it was a general counsel that was assigned to the secretary's office, uh, but it dealt with, as Sarah Clark has talked about, these big IT projects at one time. Um, as, as we sort of started looking at the functions here in the secretary's office, we just felt that position wasn't needed given the fact that we have a general counsel here in the secretary's office that could assume some of those. And plus, some of the responsibilities have been shifted elsewhere over the years. Sure, thank you. Um, and Sarah, my second question um, probably is more directed to you in terms of um, the reach up dollars. My understanding is that the federal um, money that we get for reach up, um, that actually the vast majority of it does not go directly to reach up participants, but rather to fund equally important um, aspects of supports for uh, families struggling, such as childcare and the earned income tax credit. So I'm just wondering what is happening with those. I think I want to refer you, Representative Pugh, to Commissioner Sean Brown, who will be in, I, I think it's tomorrow, he can give you more details on how the reach up dollars are spent and I will give him the, the heads up to prepare for that. Thank you. Muted. Uh, thank you, Ann, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, Kimberly, uh, Representative Jessup, your hand was up. Was your question answered? Uh, yes, uh, that was my same question. Thank you, Rep Pugh, for asking. <laughs> and Representative Brumstead? Thank you. I, um, I think I have two quick questions, and I think they're for Sarah. Um, I, and maybe they're for Sean Brown as well. So. Um, I apologize if so, but I wondered under highlights, 
there's a section you talk about the pressures and then under that is delays activity on emergency housing restructure. And I just wondered in the original governor's budget, there was also restructure around transportation under the child development division and also restructure around the children's integrated service. It was more of a regionalization. And I wondered if both of those are being re delayed as well. Thank you. My understanding and Commissioner Brown can give you more details is that both of those efforts, the transportation and the children's integrated services are still um, slated to um, be underway in state fiscal year 21. I will say that I'll expect that there has been delays in that because we have been, as you know, pretty much out straight on pandemic response since March, um, but that we are still um, planning to undertake those activities. Thank you. Did you have a second question, Jessica? Those were the two. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Hooper. Thank you. Um, my questions are in the more mundane areas of just general management of the agency. Um, let me begin by saying, I think AHS has been spectacular in its response to um, the virus. Um, and I was a little bit rough on Commissioner Baker about some other issues going on within the agency, within his department. Um, and I, I, I need to, he had a lot on his hands and was doing a pretty spectacular job. But at the same time, all of you have to continue managing personnel issues, IT issues, and just the kind of the bricks and mortars of how you get work done. Um, so I'm wondering, and one of the issues that I have had is how quickly um, AHS is able to respond to personnel related issues. And I think Secretary Smith, this has been a concern of yours in the past in terms of kind of the timeliness of resolving issues. I tried to find an email from the auditor who said that in the past calendar year, and I think it was $1.8 million were spent across state government in relief from duty pay. And I'm guessing about half of that probably belongs in AHS. So my general question is, can you comment on initiatives or efforts that you're making to deal with personnel related issues and the timely resolution of them. And maybe and I, I'm also wondering about IT, but I think that's gonna be more a DCF and you know the integrated eligibility system and how that is coming along and the management of that. Thank you for the question. Obviously um, some of the best laid plans were thrown off track uh, when, when the pandemic hit and we had to concentrate on the pandemic. But the personnel aspects of responding quickly still are at the forefront of what I'm looking at um, as we move forward with the agency. Um, I, I think you're gonna see a concentrated effort in that regard in the remainder of FY21, assuming we don't get thrown for another loop on something else. But it is a priority of mine. As you know, in a report, I was pretty critical of, uh, of the delays in, in the personnel system uh, that we, ha we have here in the agency and as we have in state government. So I, I think I can assure you that it has not gone off my radar screen. We are moving forward in, in trying to expedite um, uh, those issues as quickly as possible. I will say we've probably been delayed in a couple of areas that I wanted to see move, um, particularly some of the internal investigations that we were doing uh, that have been ramped back up now um, that um, were delayed because we simply couldn't uh, risk putting people in that weren't 
um, being tested and putting them into our uh, prison system. Uh, that's on the, that's on correction side. But um, I think generally, uh, you know, I've been very critical of the stipulations that we've done in the past. I've been very critical of of uh, sort of the delays in personal action that seem to take a long time and um, still remain that way. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to concentrate uh, in FY21 on some of those issues. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to raise this with you so that I could hear you say that and to say that I believe it really is a significant issue that that we tend to forget because it's not you know the top of the right. mind sort of thing. It, it, I, it needs to be addressed. Yeah, I haven't forgotten it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marion. Uh, thank you, Secretary Smith. Are there other questions from uh, committee members from either committee? I'm not seeing any, so we managed to go through this budget um, much more quickly. Um, oh, uh, excuse me, Representative Iacovoni, you have your hand raised. Apologize, I wasn't quick enough to get my uh, virtual hand up. Um, maybe this is something, Sarah, I can go over with you uh, offline, but by way of background, uh, some of the other committee members may hear from their uh, communities also. Uh, last year, uh, it could have happened before last year, but in any event, in the past, there was a change um, to how the agency and I believe the departments um, transferred money to community partners. Uh, the easiest way for me to explain it might be instead of um, my receiving my first quarterly payment to provide services in July, I, prov I didn't receive it for three months after I submitted uh, documentation showing that the services were rendered and the uh, outcomes and specifications were met. And it created for some a cash flow challenge. And I think you and the agency helped to ameliorate that, to uh, mitigate it, to help those agencies. There's a, a new agency, I won't go into the specifics, or, excuse me, a new organization um, that's I think for the first time going through that kind of cash uh, transition, if you will. And I wondered if uh, in the same way you were helpful with some of the parent child centers and others, if I could just work with you on that later to see if there might be a way to uh, help with that transition. Yes, Representative Iacovone, I believe I'm aware of the specific situation that you're speaking of. Um, and I know that there is a team of folks that are um, kind of researching and working to understand that issue. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll follow up with you then. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I, I'm wondering, in one of the pressures you talked about, um, you mentioned the 211 contract. Could you tell us the status of the 211 contract? And we have a question from um, Representative Hooper. Sure. The 211 contract. Um, is in place and is fully funded through the end of this state fiscal year to continue to provide those 24 seven um, services that um, I believe we were when we were in your committee in January um, talking about the need to be able to continue to do that. And so um, that the contract has been amended to allow us to do that through the end of the state fiscal year, especially in light of the pandemic. Thank you, um, Representative Hooper and then Representative Feltes. Thank you. And just since we have a little bit of time here, um, I, reference has been made to some of the planning and anticipation of um, increased caseload demands. Um, but generally, our, what sort of planning is going on for the increase in homelessness that certainly my community is experiencing, notwithstanding, again, another spectacular effort by DCF, but here in central Vermont, we're seeing a huge bump in homelessness. I suspect that food insecurity, notwithstanding efforts, is, is going to increase. 
um, the issues associated with people losing um, their PUA or UI payments are, is going to exacerbate all of that. And so Secretary Smith, I was wondering if you could talk about how you're planning for these unplanned, unforeseen things that could be happening in the future. Sure, uh, as you know, we uh, put forth a um, uh, sort of a, a plan to move people as, let me even step back even further. During the pandemic, um, we did the unprecedented, unprecedented thing of um, housing everyone that we possibly could into the hotel motel voucher system. That was um, one of the things that we thought was necessary. And if you look at our track record in terms of spread, that was a wise decision to, uh, to do that. Now we sort of have to unwind that because we can't, that if we kept that program going at the pace that we have now, it would probably annualize to about $48 million a year. That, that is something, you know, going from 5 million to 48 million with the same program is something that's unsustainable uh, as we move forward. Um, I'm racking my brains, Representative Hooper, to uh, come up with the, the steps and the specifics and the cost of the program that we put in place. But we do have a program in place to move people from those uh, motel hotels to, especially families, to uh, permanent housing as we move forward. So 23 million, I think, Sarah, $23 million program, 16 of which is uh, coronavirus relief funds uh, that we used in order to stand up this program to have available housing. Couple that with um, what is going on in Gus Selig's shop and at uh, community development in terms of housing, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, I think it's over 50 million, don't quote me on that, but the, there is a substantial effort to move people into per permanent housing as we, as we move forward. So we're not gonna get rid of the um, motel, voucher system and at least and it's going to be more than five million that we normally pay for it but we are trying to move people into permanent housing as we move forward on the issue of uh, food security as you know um, the legislature um, granted uh, um, those that deal with uh, food insecurity uh, the Vermont Food Bank, uh, $4.7 million. I believe that money has been released uh, to them uh, to help out with the programs. We are, you know, we don't know what the federal funding is going to look like in the future in terms of that, but we are rapidly moving to make sure that we have this at the local level um, that we can address those sort of issues. But we do have programs in place. These are interim programs until we can get back to the original program in FY22 that we talked about in terms of the homelessness program uh, that we originally talked to the committee about, um, seems like years ago, but um, probably you know uh, uh, six months ago that we were talking about that we will move forward in uh, 22, but we have the $23 million that we're spending um, in various phases to move um, those that need housing into permanent housing. Mr. Secretary, I, I'm certainly aware of the initiatives that were begun. And what I was trying to reflect upon is kind of the the next level, the increase over what we knew. So we knew we had, what, 1,100 um, folks without housing um, in the state. And we are now seeing an increase over that number. And so it was kind of, I, I was asking you to look into the crystal ball and figure out how you're going to respond to those pressures, not the, the pressures we knew about. We, we actually had 1,500 into, 1500. Our, into our system. And that is, um, I, I think uh, we eliminated just about the, the entire need when we did that. So that's our, I think our high watermark. Now, how do we bring it down 
from there and get people into permanent housing. And these interim steps, I think, have, um, as we move forward, uh, there's some ingenious things happening out there uh, in terms, especially in families, eliminating family homelessness. That was a goal of this step, and, and I think a, a, a good goal. Um, we'll have to take a look at how our progress is, is going as we're moving forward, but I, I think we're making good strides in, in sort of moving forward in a constructive, permanent way uh, for housing. And, and you, you've got to remember, some of the shelters are starting to open back up. They won't be at the same capacity that they did, had prior to the pandemic, because we have to talk about social distancing and other, um, other uh, cautionary things that we have to do within the shelters. Thank you. Um, that, that's a conversation I think that's continuing and um, will, uh, yeah. in the crystal ball there is going to be uh, very murky. I don't think there's a clear picture binary. I know that that's a, a priority of yours and, and trust you'll be following up on yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Representative Beltas and then uh, Representative McVaughn. Yes, thank you. I continue to have a, some confusion about this general counsel issue. You indicated an increase for that, but then one of your decreases was apparently also a general counsel issue. Maybe I'm not clear on how uh, the, the distinction between those two. Can you please help me? Yeah, we have several general counsels, <laughs> or we had several general okay. counsels, um, and I'm trying to consolidate it into one. If I may, um, uh, it, it's a bit of a technical point. The, the positions that we are proposing to eliminate are limited service positions funded by the IT projects, as we said earlier, whereas we're looking to fund an ongoing permanent general counsel. And that's because- Okay, frankly, I understand. That, and that's because frankly, the, uh, um, our previous general counsel was stolen from us, but that's- so basically, it's a swap. You're eliminating one that's limited service. However, you are adding one that will be permanent full time. And, and we did have a general. Uh, we did have a general counsel that was funded out of the attorney general's office. This brings it into our office to fund it. That person has left. So it's not a brand new position. It's moving a position. It, it it's. Um, it, it, let's call it a brand new position because it's easier to think of it that way because they're so complicated in terms of how this integrates into this. But I would I would call it an, uh, a new position that isn't really new because it used to be in this office in a way. Okay, I'm just thinking of the hiring freeze, and we're not creating a new position. No, I think I can't remember how we did this, Sarah. Do you? It's a position from the pool. So we did get the, in, in light of the hiring freeze and all of that, we did follow the you know right procedures to get the actual position. Okay, and Kimberly, you'll follow up on all of that and be able to explain it to anybody who asks, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> so <it's> just, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, make it, we'll make it as plain as mud. <laughs> Marty, were you finished? Thank you. No, I'm through, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative McFaughn. Uh, thank you. Um, let me get the dog out of here. Um, I have had some questions this week from uh, child care center people. Um, they have a concern. I think I gave them the right answer, but I want to make sure. Um, they're worried about all of this money uh, for stabilization grants that they may re receive or, or they can apply for, uh, any of this CARES money. Um, they're concerned that it may be considered income and uh, they will have to uh, pay taxes or they might end up in another tax bracket because of it. And um, so if uh, any of the administration people can answer that question, are those grants or any of the CARES money, or any of the stabilization money, is that considered, going to be considered income to those people? 
Yeah, uh, Representative, I'm going to have to take that offline. I, 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 I don't have a quick answer for that, but let's let's write it down. Let's take it offline. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of the circumstance, and maybe I can get to it offline a little bit. You know, we've we have funded through the coronavirus relief fund and and perhaps other funds uh, approximately 35 million dollars. Uh, to uh, keep child care open during the, the height of the pandemic, plus on the restart, and that was for essential workers. And also, we kept the in infrastructure of the child care centers uh, intact by paying them during when they didn't have people, uh, when they didn't have children, uh, keeping it intact during the pandemic. We started up on June 1st. Uh, with um, six million dollars, I believe it was in uh, startup grants. The legislature added to that of twelve million dollars, which were um, which were taking applications in. Now, um, the governor announced yesterday another twelve million dollars going um, requesting uh, money from the legislature to um, uh, add some capacity in child care. So there is a lot of money in there, and plus. You know, um, you know what what else um, is available to them in terms of uh, of relief. I don't know the answer to your question in terms of what's taxable and not taxable. But let let me uh, Sarah Sarah will follow up uh, offline and we'll try to figure it out uh, for you. Secretary Smith, actually, we have legislative counsel here that will be able to weigh in on the new, uh, CRF facts and questions. And so we can get a, a, a quick answer from, uh, Jen Carvey. Thank you, Jen. Sure. Uh, so Jennifer Carvey, legislative counsel, um, the federal government recently updated their CRF, uh, frequently asked questions. And one of them went to exactly that question. And then they link to, the IRS website, and the, the short answer seems to be yes. Uh, the question is, if governments use fund payments as described in the fund guidance to establish a grant program to support businesses, would those funds be considered gross income taxable to a business receiving the grant under the IRS code? And the answer is yes. The receipt of a government grant by a business generally is not excluded from the business's gross income under the code and is therefore taxable. I don't know how it would be treated under our state tax laws, but the, the answer from the federal level seems to be that that is taxable income. Thank you, and if you maybe follow up later um, with Topper about um, state taxes, whether they would be applicable uh, for Vermont state taxes as well. Topper, did you have a follow up or? No, 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 that, that's... Uh... That's that's not the, that's not the answer I gave. <laughs> um, we have uh, just under ten minutes left. We have uh, Representative Lamper and Representative Yacovoni. There were some additional slides that Sarah had in this yes. deck. However, they're directly related to uh, the overview of the specific departments. And so, if you want to uh, go through those on your own, and when the specific departments are in, those are where those detailed questions. Um, uh, could be asked or should be asked. Um, so, uh, Diane. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's exactly what my question was. I was thinking and watching the clock, like, wait a minute, we've got so many slides to go through. And um, so I think you've answered it. We will go through those with the department or the agency when they come in. Okay. And Sarah will be here as well to, um, uh, to help answer, but the uh, commissioners will really have the detailed information um, that, that, uh, we'll answer some of our questions. And to be uh, clear, they'll go through a more detailed presentation. This was just designed to give you across the agency. This is what is included in the restatement. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Dave? Dave? I yes. Uh, th th thank you. Um, uh, Secretary Smith, yesterday when I was speaking with uh, Secretary French, uh, we brought up the issue about success beyond six uh, and the importance of what that is, not to a, just to our designated agencies, but to children uh, uh, learning in a remote learning uh, environment who have safety and supervision issues. He said it was front and center, I think he said on his, uh, on his burner. I think those are the words he used. Um, uh, it, it's complicated, as you may know, because 
to a large degree, it depends on what the local school districts do. And, and last I checked, I don't think your position can do a lot with, with that, though I wish it could. You've done such a great job with everything else. Um, but my, my concern is that um, to the degree you can, you help uh, with that. I'm worried that the commissioner of mental health who's doing great work um, alone may not be able to uh, move the needle uh, sufficiently. The, the revenue from that program, notwithstanding the importance of the work, um, is critical to the stability of the designated agencies. Without it, I would assume uh, they would be knocking on your door for more stabilization funds help. Can you speak to this at all? Is this something that's on your yep. radar or is it too removed? No, it is on my radar. And um, Representative Iacovone, you know, that you may recall this is a program that's pretty near and dear to my heart, um, given the fact that, you know, I was here to the lot when we sort of started this sort of program as we were uh, moving forward here. I met with the designated agencies the other day and said I would I would meet with Secretary French. I made the commitment to meet with Secretary French to see what we could do here um, to advance to advance and continue this program. I think it's a wonderful program, obviously, uh, or else I you know I wouldn't have proposed it a long time ago. But it um, it is something that I think is needed. I think it's something, especially during these times that um, is important. So Secretary French and I, and I think it's this week, are supposed to get together to sort of noodle this and figure out a way that we can, um, we, we can get together. That was the promise I made to the designated agencies and I'll fulfill that promise this week, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you, Dave. I don't see any other questions at this time. And so I would like to thank uh, Secretary Smith and, and Sarah Clark for coming in, and knowing that much of what is covered here, you know, as far as reductions in pressures within programs, we will really be addressing within the individual budgets. This is um, where the conversations will go a bit deeper. But I did want to keep, uh, keep both committees on for 10 minutes. Um, so that we have a plan to expedite this process through with each budget and getting feedback back to our committee. So Sarah and Mike, you're, you're welcome to stay. Sarah, we'll see you um, obviously when the other budgets come in, but we're just going to do some coordination of um, how we get feedback and, and move this budget quickly since we have two weeks. Um, and Madam, to Madam Chair, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign off, but thank you so much and thank the committees for your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your work. We know how difficult this has been and we really appreciate what you do for struggling Vermonters. Thank I'm getting, you. I'm getting too old for this. No. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> Bye now. Thank you. Um, so uh, with the two committees, um, what, um, what I would like to, to do is to make sure that um, all questions are answered or at least we have the questions if they're not answered on the table or our concerns on the table. And ultimately, <clears throat> and from your committee, we want an informal letter. We don't need you know, any formal letters, but I just need something better than my notes um, that, that says you, know, you are or are not okay with the elimination of the two positions, um, maybe weighing in on the need of the need or not using the one-time money so that or using the one-time money either way so that there's not disruptions in services at this time because we, you know, we don't know what the fiscal landscape is going to be. We don't know what the pandemic is going to do. And so some confirmation either way of the use of uh, one-time money. As far as the pressures that were mentioned on choices for care and on reach up and on um, you know, Medicaid in general, I'd like to address those within the specific budgets. And so if, if others agree and ask me if I'm missing something, it's really the use of one-time money to not disrupt services, mostly through the Medicaid, um, the FMAP bump, and, and then the positions, the eliminations of two positions, but one being created within the secretary's office. 
does anyone have something else? Uh, Kimberly, thank you. This is your budget. Yeah, I, I just also don't want to drop uh, Rep. Brumstead's uh, good comments about uh, DCF-specific issues relating to CIS and transportation. But I think, Kitty, you're focusing right now more on AHS. The only other topic that I've heard some chatter about and that didn't come up is I know that the uh, racial justice uh, position is in the AHS office and there has been some interest uh, in the political world about what that uh, uh, director uh, is doing and whether there's sufficient staff um, support. And I don't know if that's uh, something we wanna put in a query. I can pop out an email on that. And then also there was a substance abuse position that was also in there. And I don't know where things stand with that. So related to the staffing questions on general counsel, which I'm crafting an email right now to follow up on, those are just the other two pieces. And I don't know if anyone on uh, human services wants to weigh in on any of that. Thanks. So Kimberly, I'm going to leave those two to you, uh, those two positions and <clears throat> whether there's sufficient staffing. Those would be good questions um, to start with. Uh, I think Sarah Clark, and then she can lead you um, where you where you need to get more information. Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Diane. Thank you. Along that same line, um, Kimberly is. You know, I had a I know, just a momentary thought around the positions around that general counsel that typically they were in, or maybe it's in the attorney general's office that they work on with AHS. What does that mean to have that coming now, not from the, the position, not being a part of the attorney general's office and the attorney being now very specifically to a particular department within a political environment? I'm, I'm not too sure where that, where that could have problems, but I thought I, we should probably check that out. Yeah, thanks. That's a great point. Thank you, Diane. Perfect. Um, Anne? Um, thank you. Um, Kitty, uh, part of me uh, thinks that uh, I need to hear some more specifics from the departments. I mean, as they identify one-time pressures or the, as they identify caseload pressures, um, the community providers and uh, individual Vermonters may in fact be identifying different pressures or additional pressures. And so that is, and I in particular am very curious, um, I think, uh, where are the uh, case, where are the savings coming from um, all of the departments? There were. Um, that, so, so what aren't we doing? Um, and what That's is the impact, yeah. uh, in terms of that? Um, and so that, you know, in some, some level, um, I rely on members of my committee and the community to let us know in terms of mm -hmm. sort of what are the questions to be asking. Yeah. Um, for instance, a very narrow kind of questions. As an example, um, how much how much money is going to be in the tobacco fund? Um, what we have heard is that um, um, it's important to reduce smoking, especially during COVID, because of its connection to um, the additional risk in terms of uh, health risks. And so, you know, those kinds of things. I certainly understand that, Anne. And for you and for your committee, we have two public hearings scheduled where we will hear from advocates and we will hear from Vermonters. They're next week on the 27th and 28th. We're holding them with the Senate just to expedite this budget. And the first one on Thursday is at five o'clock. And the second one is on Friday at one o'clock. And Teresa, will you be sending out those links to all members so that they can uh, listen in if they choose? Uh, yes, the uh, press release with the uh, YouTube link has been sent and I'll resend them on Monday. Um, so uh, Kitty, what is, the, um, what is the date by which you would like uh, the feedback from human services? The so, yeah. what I would, 
<clears throat> what I, I don't know what's going on with my throat. Um, <clears throat> what I would like and what I'm asking, we had a couple of uh, budgets in yesterday, is not to wait for all of human services to be covered. So if, if um, let's say the central office is, is you know, you, you've made decisions that you, you know, you have recommendations or you agree with the, what's being presented, that as soon as an area has been, um, you, you've been able to reflect on it and if there's no changes or you know what you would like changed, get that to us as fast as you can. And they don't have to be formal memos. They can be an email to um, Teresa and uh, to the committee uh, just saying, you know, we've reviewed the central office. We agree or disagree with the position eliminations and understand or don't or don't agree with the use of one-time money. And it can be as simple as that. But if there's a big issue with DCF, I don't want to hold off on the other pieces. Because I want to um, close out as many or or get working on the issues that are at hand. And so I know that's a little bit more work, but it's it's completely informal. And um, as we go through these budgets, when your committee has made decisions or recommendations, get them to us as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Um, I'm assuming that you all will be looking at, we the, the legislature passed a quarter budget and the administration is basing this on the budget that they, presented in January. And so if they're making any changes in terms of the budget that we passed mm -hmm. and was signed that reflect not just money, but perhaps a, a policy direction, how are we gonna figure that out? Um, well, we're going to figure it out together. Uh, it may be things that we agree with because the landscape may or may have changed and so if we agree with it that will be easy if we don't then we will have an alternative um plan that we would put in our budget so um i and see i see that sarah is still on the call so sarah i would appreciate that um as e either in an email to me or as part of the presentations if that makes sense for the department um commissioners to make mention of that to highlight changes from what we already passed in the quarter one budget to especially. Okay. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I think we can maybe at a high level, let me get a narrative together that talks about what the difference is um, between the one quarter budget and what we're, what we're providing to you now. That would be helpful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the exact timing of the budget, I do not know uh, the date that uh, we're going to be um, expected to get the budget out of committee to have on the floor. But knowing that our public hearings are not until Thursday or Friday, we, we will not be making any final decisions until we hear from uh, Vermonters. And the following week, um, we have, I don't even know when Labor Day is. Labor Day is the 7th. So I'm not sure if um, the fourth is the date that we would, um, the third and fourth to get the budget out, or if we have a little bit more time after Labor Day, just to give you a time frame of, of where we are. But we do need a couple of days at least after the public hearings. That date is uh, above my pay grade right now of what the schedule is for the House and Senate and to adjourn. Uh, Mary and Kimberly. Yeah, thank you. You were looking for questions or concerns that we need to go into some more. And I was trying to get at this with the secretary and it has to do with our capacity to address the unknown that the future is going to bring us. And I'm really concerned that we have um, so constrained our staffing resources that I, we don't have the ability to get at the next wave. And that, that's a real uh, ethereal sort of conversation, sadly, but I think it's one we need to pay attention to. So if human resources has any ideas 
uh, Human Services has any ideas on what we ought to be doing there, I, I sure would be interested in how to pay attention to that. And then a very specific question, part of the Vermont legal aid budget resides in the central office budget. It is also in other parts of AHS. Um, and I don't know if it is adequately resourced to do the job that they we've asked them to do um, with regard to housing and rehousing and kind of rental assistance. So those are the things yeah. that come to my mind, but there may be more. Yeah, really. So um, that, that's a question on my hand is how are we doing with legal aid? And, um, and, and there's, there's two different pieces here, whether we're talking about um, the general fund budget or whether we're talking about the use of CRF funds um, in order to pay for uh, specific uh, projects and programs to get through this pandemic. And there will be uh, probably some CRF funds re reflected in this budget, whether we'll do a separate bill uh, for the remainder of the CRF funds, um, that that is still uh, under discussion. The the, um, the administration has combined both the budget and their CRF priorities all in one bill, and um, we do know that there are some CRF issues that need to get out faster than this budget is going to get out. So there will probably be an earlier CRF bill for things that need immediate attention. Um, and then there will be the budget and whether there'll be then another CRF bill, that's, I'm not sure if it's going to be all in one or we'll separate it out in two. Uh, it all depends on uh, timing and what the federal government does with the next package, um, not knowing what, well, we'll know what our priorities are, but we won't know exactly uh, what the federal government is giving us for the amount of funds, how they can be used, what restrictions are on them. Okay, any other final thoughts? Uh, Kimberly will be directly in touch with your committee and uh, Anne, whenever um, you could, uh, if your committee assistant could, could send an email to our committee member that, that it's so they can listen into your discussion, that sometimes is, is helpful in moving things along quickly too. Any other final thoughts or questions or concerns? I'm um, just a kitty. I, um, I was not, um, and if you want us to do something different, I will. Um, I was looking at this week as um, members getting the information and that us having the discussion on next Tuesday when our committee, sorry, you don't know this yet, when, when the committee is going to be meeting, but do you need it before then? Um, next Tuesday is the 25th. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, that's when we begin. That's when we all return. Yeah. No, no, that, no, no. And nope, you have, you have, you have plenty of time. You have a few days in. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and if for some of this, you may want to hear, uh, wait until you hear from advocates and wait from, and hear from Vermonters regarding certain policy, but um, anything you can get into us as soon as you can after you formally meet on the 25th would be wonderful. And, and don't hold anything back, you know, send lots of small uh, memos and emails instead of one large letter uh, from your committee. And uh, Teresa and Maria will not be sending out um, letters to the committees. They take at least five or six days to go through the entire budget and cite all the sections. And so that's why <clears throat> um, you know, we're meeting jointly to expedite this. And so don't wait for a letter from our committee saying, you know, you're in this, this, and this section. Those aren't, there's not time to put those out. But we're more than happy to help you find the sections of the budget if you have a question. Okay. Any final thoughts? This is new territory for all of us, but I really appreciate both committees meeting together. I, I think that it's uh, going to help us move more quickly and understand each other's concerns and uh, to get a budget out that is responsible for Vermont and to help Vermonters. Anne, any final thoughts? Thank you for joining us. Whoops, you were muted. 
I was just saying no and thank you. And um, I want to say the committee human services knows what to do, which is to connect with the folks that they've been connecting with. Um, and uh, we can all circle back next week in terms of what we've heard and what else we need to hear. It's going to be a fun ride. <laughs> Let's just hold on. So we're going to take a break until 1030 and at 1030, um, Teresa will have, it's the same link, Teresa will have the link for you. I'll and send you a link shortly we'll for the next you. meeting. Thank you, Teresa, and uh, be ready for the Agency of Digital Services. Okay, thank you everyone. Live stream now. Thank you.